Hello everyone and welcome to the Conqueror's Podcast. Episode 5.1 The Rise of Assyria Before we start this episode, I wanted to apologize for the delay in its release. I wanted to record this episode with the new recording equipment that I have ordered, but I wasn't able to get everything ready for this episode. By the next one, however, I hope that everything will be ready and that the sound quality will improve. Last episode, we talked about the Hotmos III, the greatest warrior pharaoh in the history of Egypt, who brought Egypt to its largest territorial extent and to the height of its military and economic power. Just a side note here, despite the fact that Egypt will endure and will remain one of the wealthiest and most sought-after lands in the world, the Hotmos will be our last great native Egyptian conqueror. That's right, in the following 3,250 years or so, Egypt itself will be the home of great kingdoms and empires, but these will be established and ruled by foreigners who neither considered themselves Egyptians, nor were they native Egyptians. Great rulers and conquerors like Saladin, or Baibars for example, were great conquerors, but they were of Kurdish and Kipchak descent. And that, in my opinion, is a tragic fate for this great and ancient country, who gave the world so much, and was at one point, and will be in the future, the greatest and most powerful in the world. This week's background episode takes us back to Mesopotamia, and specifically, to northern Mesopotamia, to a city that would go on to become the capital and namesake for what many modern historians consider as the world's first true empire, Assyria. That's because, although the Egyptians were the first ones to build a truly stable and lasting empire, unlike their predecessors the Akkadians and the Babylonians, who had to constantly struggle with external and internal threats, they were neither an expansive nor a warlike people, and other than a few exceptions like the Hotmos III and Ramses II, mostly minded their own business. The Mesopotamian civilizations, on the other hand, lived in a rough neighborhood, constantly facing threats, both internal and external, which meant that war was a necessity. You either fought back or you would be taken over. And while that means that the Mesopotamian societies were more warlike and expansive, they were far less stable and lasting than the Egyptians. The Assyrians, however, were able to combine these two aspects, building a stable, though ruthless, empire with a highly militaristic, warlike society constantly seeking expansion and conquest. To make the distinction, for the town and later city of Ashur, I will stick with the original native name, while for the region inhabited by the Assyrians and later empire, I will use Assyria. The people who would later be called Assyrians were Akkadian speakers who settled in what is today northern Mesopotamia, in the late 4th millennium BC. By the middle of the 3rd millennium BC, they had founded several settlements, the most prominent of whom would later be Ashur and Nineveh both located on the Tigris River. Similar to other Mesopotamian cities, the city of Ashur was considered to house its own god or deity, Ashur. I wasn't able to find a definite meaning of the name Ashur, nor if it was granted first to the settlement, the region, or the deity. No evidence were found to associate the god Ashur with a particular element or power. Later on, as the Assyrians interacted with their other Mesopotamian neighbors, they adopted the Mesopotamian pantheon, positioning Ashur at its head. And as the Assyrian armies expanded their empire, Ashur came to embody Assyria's power, as well as the supremacy of their god over their enemies. For most of the first millennium of its existence, the city of Ashur was dominated by its neighbors, primarily those from the south, about whom we discussed in previous episode. First were the Sumerians, who called the region of northern Mesopotamia Subartu. During this period, major Assyrian towns like Ashur primarily served as administrative centers for Sumerian rule and elites. Afterwards, like many other regions and peoples of Mesopotamia and the Levant, Assyria was conquered by Sargon the Great and his Akkadian Empire. During this period, Ashur became the administrative center for the region. When Akkad fell to the Gutian invaders from the east, Assyria regained its independence for a short time before falling under the influence of the last great native Sumerian dynasty, the third dynasty of Ur. 
With the immigrations of the Amorites from the west came the decline and collapse of the Sumerian power. By this point, Ashur had grown to become a major urban center of the region, with its own independent line of kings. More importantly, the people of Assyria began to form their own unique cultural identity. You see, up to this point, one could say that the peoples of Ashur were more or less just another Akkadian-speaking people. But from this point on, the Assyrians began developing their own cultural traits that made them a distinct people, the most prominent of whom were the language, as the people of Ashur began to develop their own distinct dialect, and the burial practices. Along with cuisine and dress codes, burial practices are considered the most crucial for the formation of an ethnic or cultural identity. And while we know little to nothing about the cuisine and dress code of the Assyrians, their burial practices do provide us with information on how markedly different they developed from their neighbors. The power and influence of the kings of Ashur began to expand beyond their town and the Tigris, slowly encompassing the region that is today called Assyria. In the relatively peaceful period that followed, trade between Mesopotamia and Anatolia increased, and the city of Ashur benefited from its strategic location on the crossroads of these two regions. The construction of the first major temple in the city, dedicated to its patron god, Ashur, dates back to this period, about the end of the 3rd millennium BC. The influence of the Assyrian people themselves also expanded, with new colonies established in Anatolia and the Levant. This first period of independence came to an end at the hands of a ruler slash conqueror we mentioned during episode 3.1, Shamshi Adad, who from his base in El Kalatum, conquered much of Mesopotamia and Syria, including Ashur, establishing the short-lived kingdom of Upper Mesopotamia. Shamshi Adad himself claimed to have been of Assyrian origin, and although many archaeologists in the past believed that he was an Assyrian, modern archaeologists and scholars now believe that Shamshi Adad was an Amorite. Still, he went to great lengths to depict himself as the rightful ruler of Ashur, claiming to be a descendant of a previous Assyrian ruler, and even though it wasn't the capital of his kingdom, he spent lavishly on the city of Ashur, expanding the city and great temple of Ashur, and building the city's great palace. That his kingdom is also known as the Old Assyrian Empire gives us an indication on how synonymous he came to be with Ashur. Shamshi Adad's kingdom did not survive his death, and soon after, a native king retook power, expelling Amorite rule. But not for long, as after a while, a new Amorite conqueror, the second conqueror to be included in this podcast, Hammurabi of Babylon, expanded the power of his kingdom from a small kingdom in southern Mesopotamia to an empire that stretched from the Persian Gulf to Anatolia. And although it wasn't conquered, Ashur and its kings were made a vassal of Babylon. That was the beginning of a bitter rivalry between the two future great cities of Mesopotamia. With the death of Hammurabi, unrest erupted across his empire, and a man named Adasi was able to expel the Babylonians from Assyria, establishing a new dynasty in Ashur. The next 250 years were quite peaceful for Assyria, with no major events recorded. There are few surviving records from this period, and from those who did survive, it seems that the kings of Ashur mainly focused on internal matters, like infrastructure and construction projects, including the expansion of the city and upgrading its fortifications. Assyria mostly avoided the turmoil suffered by its neighbors that were caused by invasions of new peoples, the Hittites in Anatolia, who later raided Mesopotamia and sacked Babylon, the Mitanni in Syria and eastern Anatolia, and finally, the Kashites who invaded Babylon from the east, overthrowing the Amorite elite, though the people of Babylon remained mostly Amorites. From around the middle of the 15th century BC, however, troubles began brewing, as the Mitanni established their kingdom in Syria and began expanding. Being that they were blocked in the south by the greatest power of the region at that point, the new kingdom of Egypt, their eyes turned east to Mesopotamia and north to Anatolia. It is here that we go back to our previous episode, where I mentioned that Tahotmos III, who led ancient Egypt to the pinnacle of its military power, received emissaries and gifts from many foreign rulers, who came to ask for his friendship. Among these 
were emissaries from Ashur, sent by either King Ashur Rabi I or King Ashur Nadin Ahi I, who came seeking either assistance or an alliance with the mighty Pharaoh against the expansive Mitanni. Eventually, however, no assistance came from the Egyptians, as Tahatmos III didn't launch any major campaign against the Mitanni after his famous Eighth Campaign, while the Assyrian overtures gave the Mitanni a casus belli for war. And soon, the Mitanni invaded Assyria, sacking Ashur itself, even taking the gold and silver doors of the great temple of Ashur to their capital. What followed was almost a century of Mitanni domination over Ashur and Assyria, lasting until the reign of Eriba Adad. Taking advantage of a dynastic struggle in the Mitanni court, the king supported and aided the eventually victorious faction. With that, not only did Eriba Adad succeed in throwing off the Mitanni domination, he was able to exert Assyrian influence on the Mitanni. When his son, Ashur Ubalid I, succeeded to the throne, he was able to completely break Mitanni power, decisively defeating them in battle. Not only did Ashur Ubalid assert Assyrian independence, he set about making Ashur a regional power, at the expense of not just the Mitanni, but more importantly, the bitter rival of Ashur, Babylon. This he achieved by marrying his daughter to the Kashite king of Babylon. When the latter died, he was succeeded by his half-Assyrian son. Resentment against this, however, was so great in Babylon that a revolt erupted, resulting in the death of Ashur Ubalit's grandson. Now probably enraged, and no doubt spotting an opportunity, the king invaded Babylonian territory, placing a new king of his own choice on the Babylonian throne. Thus, Ashur Ubalit's reign is considered to have initiated a new period of Assyrian supremacy that is today called the Middle Assyrian Empire. Along with several great Assyrian kings, who were also great conquerors, this period saw several important developments for Ashur and Assyria. 1. This period saw the transformation of Assyria into a warlike state and society with an obligatory military service for all Assyrian free men and an ideology of expansion as a destiny and mandate from the god Ashur taking root. It came to be expected from a great and successful king to lead his armies to war and expand the state while the god Ashur became the symbol of the power of Assyria. 2. The start of the procedure that would go on to be the most identified with Assyrian power, the mass deportation of populations. This was not only a punishment inflicted upon a conquered people, but a means of adding to the growth and stability of the empire, and that those who were relocated were assimilated into pre-existing communities. 3. Religion became an important aspect in the new imperial apparatus, with the king functioning as the high priest of Ashur, and the priesthood becoming a major power in Assyrian society. 4. The supremacy of Assyria over Babylon was firmly established, with the Assyrians conquering and sacking the great city several times. This supremacy would go on to last until the fall of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, more than 700 years later. 5. The consolidation of Ashur's power and influence over the region of Assyria was completed. From now on, the region, city, and people of Assyria would become synonymous, and the region would go on to form a core that will preserve Assyrian power and identity the later lasting to our present day. I didn't include any of the Assyrian kings of the Middle Empire in the list of great conquerors because the Middle Assyrian Empire was very unstable, with the reigns of most of its successful rulers being followed by either civil war or short reigns that led to instability. Also, even at its height, it wasn't near the size and power that would later be achieved by the Neo-Assyrian Empire. The end of the Middle Assyrian Empire came as a result of a period known as the Late Bronze Age Collapse. This period is one of the most mysterious and intriguing periods in history, and it could have its own podcast. In short, it was a period that witnessed a violent and sudden upheavals in societies and trade across the Near East, Anatolia, North Africa, the Caucasus, the Balkans, and the Eastern Mediterranean, and resulted in either a major decline or total collapse of several civilizations, including the Mycenaean Greek kingdoms, of the Kashites in Babylon, of the Hittite Empire in Anatolia and the Levant, and the New Kingdom of Egypt.
It also saw the destructions of many coastal settlements across the eastern Mediterranean by a mysterious people whose origin has yet to be determined, the Sea People. And like similar periods across history, these events led to migrations of new peoples, including Iranian peoples such as the Medes, Parthians, and of course, Persians, as well as Semitic speakers such as the Chaldeans, and more importantly for our next episode, the Arameans, who went on to settle and eventually wrestle control of the Levant from the Assyrians. Remarkably, for the first 150 years of this period, the Assyrians thrived, being able to fend off most invaders and launch several campaigns on all directions. Near the end of the second millennium BC, however, Assyria went into a relative decline, losing much of its power and territory. Still, it was far less affected than any of the other great powers and civilizations of the area, and eventually, this period would go on to provide the perfect circumstances for the Assyrians to launch their third empire, that would go on to become the greatest the world had ever seen. You see, that Assyrian core territory I mentioned earlier survived pretty much intact, with a stable monarchy, a warrior society that provided the best and most badass army in the world, and an efficient administration that still supported trade and tax collection. These are most evident in the many Assyrian written records that survived and give us the impression that in Assyria itself, business mostly went on as usual. Thus, Assyria was the first state to recover. The final ruler of the Middle Assyrian Empire is considered to have been Tiglath Pileser II, or in native Assyrian, Tawakkuluti Abil Ishara, which means, my trust is in the son of Ishara. I get particularly excited when I read the Assyrian names and their meanings, because, as a native speaker of a distant relative of these ancient Semitic languages, Arabic, many of them bear similarity to their modern Arabic versions. For instance, Tiglath Pileser in Arabic would be Tawakkuli Ibn Ishara. And it amazes me when I read many other words from a language more than 3,500 years old and I'm still able to understand much of them. Okay, back to Tiglath Pileser. His reign was an uneventful one, and he seems to have continued the policy of his predecessors of the last century, mostly minding their own business in Assyria, watching over their borders to keep troubles out on the one hand, while maintaining and strengthening their core territories on the other. It was the reign of his son, Ashur Dan II, that would mark the beginning of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, an empire that would one day become the largest the world had ever seen and would set a whole new definition and scale for empires. I'm gonna stop here today at the onset of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. The next episode will cover the early history of this empire as well as the reign of our next great conqueror and the first of a series of great Assyrian conquerors. Ashur Nasirpal II. Thank you all for listening to the Conquerors podcast. If you like the podcast, don't forget to rate it and press the subscribe button. Your reviews and comments are most welcome. You can leave them on the podcast's Facebook and Instagram pages called the Conquerors podcast, a YouTube channel with the same name, or on iTunes or any platform you guys use to listen. You can also contact me directly at the Conquerors Podcast at gmail.com. See you on the next one.